Uh, this idea grew out of a consortium of investigators uh, that formed the uh, Barrett's Esophagus Translational Research Network. And the challenges that we proposed to ourselves a number of years ago, um, that's supposed to be screening, that over 90% of cancers occur in previously undiagnosed. Problems with screening are that upper endoscopy is costly, it's ineffective, and, and we only do it in less than 10% of people who progress to cancer. So we don't diagnose most of barriers. We're the only ones who recommend doing screening. General societies don't recommend screening endoscopy. Even if we di diagnose Barrett's esophagus, then we do surveillance, which consists of endoscopy and biopsy, which look for dysplasia, and that's largely ineffective because of difficulties in interpreting dysplasia, problems with random sampling, and so we don't have good methods of prognostication. Uh, as a consequence of problems with screening and surveillance, uh, over 90% of cancers occurred previously undiagnosed Barrett's, and our survival for patients diagnosed with cancer is less than 20%. My apologies, I don't know how, and I can't figure out how this first line of the slide got changed. I hope the rest of the deck is fine. So at our research center, we've adopted a biomarker-based approach um, getting away from histology and pathology for early detection of esophageal cancer. And that approach has three legs. One is the development of biomarkers for molecular screening for Barrett's. The second leg is molecular biomarkers for surveillance that can identify those with Barrett's who are going to progress. And then the third leg is developing a non-endoscopic sampling device for the esophagus that allows us to use these biomarkers. And here's the case team, Helen Moynova, who's the postdoc who developed methylation assays and identified the markers. Sandy Markowitz, whose lab she's done this in, and Sandy's been in the field of colon cancer biomarkers for a large number of years, and Joe Willis, our pathologist. And, and why have we insisted on methylated DNA markers? Well, they're quantitative biomarkers. They can be highly sensitive and specific. Uh, one advantage of looking at methylated DNA is it's automatable, so it can bring down the cost. And, and we know that there are methylated DNA biomarkers that are already coming into medical clinical use that are approved by the FDA. So this is an avenue that is going to explode, and, and it's a feasible avenue for developing the test. Uh, our first foray was prompted by a biomarker that Sandy Markowitz had originally developed for stool DNA. It's still a great biomarker for stool DNA, but we wanted to know why people who didn't have colon polyps were getting positive imentin and we checked their upper tract, and lo and behold, in a number of cases, it was coming from Barrett's esophagus or esophageal adenocarcinoma. Uh, we followed that up to determine whether we could identify it just by looking at brushings for Barrett's and cancers, and in a small set, we found that we could detect methylated bimentin, in brushings from Barrett's and cancers with a sensitivity of 90%. So serendipitously having a biomarker in hand, we then looked at it more scientifically in a training set and a validation set. Everyone going endoscopy saw the deal brushings done and frozen at the time of endoscopy. And it's unusual for a biomarker to perform equally well, if not better, what, uh, better in the validation set where it had an area under the curve of 0.956 versus 0.948 and using the same cutoff, the sensitivity and specificity were actually a little bit higher, all over 90% for bimentin. So one biomarker is better, can we goose it up by finding a second biomarker that performs equally well? And we went through the genome, looked at millions of CPGs, and identified this biomarker, cyclin A1, 
which is methylated in the long run of a CPD patch. And CCNA performed equally well in the training set and the validation set. And when you put the two together, you did not lose specificity and you actually gained sensitivity. We then wanted to put these biomarkers through the ringer and put test them in other diseases that may alter the specificity. So we looked at a variety of different esophageal pathologies, gastric pathologies that you might commonly encounter, such as chronic carditis, eosinophilic esophagitis, cirrhosis esophagitis, and found that these markers would not turn up in the presence of inflammatory disease, making them fairly robust for um, clinical testing. The one thing we did find was these methylated biomarkers, bimentin more than CCNA1, would be positive if you tested the proximal esophagus of smokers. Uh, it was probably coming from the oral pharyngeal cavity where it's known that smoking causes high degree of methylation. So our challenge was to develop a device that allowed comfortable non-endoscopic sampling because we knew we could find them in brushings, but we wanted to restrict our sampling to the distal esophagus and G junction. That allows us to decrease signal to noise but more importantly, as you're withdrawing that sample through the proximal esophagus in a mouth and a smoker, it avoids contamination so that you can get a good sample of the distal esophagus for your markers and allow, uh, minimize the false positivity. And this is our device, which may be the last time I'll be calling it Jess. <laughs> It's the Joe Amatop Sandy Swallowable Sampling Balloon. And, and in a sense, it's just the way it's a esophageal pap smear to detect Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer. Um, Jeff Ponsky, who some of you may know, this is Jeff Ponsky's Centrum Silver. And Jeff is a great marketer. He said, you got to show it with your device just to show the size of the device that the patient's trying to swallow. It contains a balloon inside the capsule that's got these features. You can invert the balloon back into the capsule. The sample remembers on the outside, so when you invert it, the sample is protected inside the balloon, on the balloon surface, and you get goop around on the capsule, but the sample is protected. And then you take it out and you send it out to your friendly neighborhood DNA methylator. This is what generation one looked like uh, being done originally in, for this video, we asked Dr. Jeff Marks, one of our surgeons. So you see it being balloon inflated. That's the resting state. And then with a little negative vacuum, the device comes in, you swallow it with the device inside, you go down, you inflate it at 45 centimeters, you feel the lower esophageal sphincter, pull back a little bit the sample the distal esophagus, re-invert, uh, bring it out inverted, theoretically you put it out in your vial and you send it off to the lab. So in generation one, uh, again, the jazz balloon, small size, designing maximized sample quantity, designed to maximize the biomarker signal to noise by targeting the distal esophagus and protecting it from dilution and contamination from the oropharynx and proximal esophagus. We recruited 156 subjects from three hospitals. Uh, in the first generation, 128 or 18% were not able to swallow the device. And a lot of it was flopping around in the mouth that just wouldn't get to the back of the throat. And in 116 of the 128 swallowed, 9% we did not get enough DNA. Uh, so 86 individuals had evaluable diagnoses. We did exclude individuals for post-ablation, etc where we couldn't tell what the methylation meant. 
Uh, how did it perform? It took a mean of about three minutes, so very quick. 72% of the subjects rated overall tolerance is excellent. 93% said they preferred to having to endoscopy again, and they were about to go on endoscopy. Scores of one or two on a 10-point Liker scale by majority of people for most symptoms. The only symptom that did have a little bit more of a score than two was gagging. And the gagging only happens when it's being introduced. And I can show it to you if you want to stick around. I'm happy to swallow it. I, I went to college where Brett Kavanaugh went to college and there were a lot of drinking games and we, we learned how to swallow without gag. Um, these are the samples, so 36 case, uh, controls, 50 cases, a variety of different histologies and lengths. And as you can see, albeit broad confidence intervals, the methylated VIM and methylated CCNA1 perform almost equally as good as the brushings did during endoscopy. Now this is in a small sample set. Again, sensitivity was 90%, specificity was 92%. Uh, giving us to conclude that the encapsulated balloon can sample the distal esophagus with excellent tolerability and acceptability. The two biomarkers can be successfully assayed on samples we obtained from uh, the balloon. And Barrett's cancer can be detected with high sensitivity and specificity at least in this feasibility study. Um, we were lucky enough in January to have it presented in Science Translational Medicine, and these are all the co-authors who contributed. And the National Cancer Institute, or NIH, just submitted this in their director's annual report to Congress and the President, and we're hoping the President does read this one. And they did highlight our device uh, extensively in that report. So where have we done and what have we done since then? Well, we've come to generation two where we spent about a year improving the design of the balloon, primarily to improve swallowing. We've made it a little bit stiffer and added a little bit of features to improve DNA sampling. We've embarked on a larger case control study uh, with a number of collaborating centers to more precisely define our cutoffs and performance. And we've started a multi-center BetterNet Barrett's detection study initiated at least at this, uh, these hospitals, UH, Ahuja, Cleveland Clinic, Hopkins, UNC, WashU, Mayo. Um, I'm not sure whether this is correct, but. John and Adomi was here. He thinks we're about to start, right? Yes. I think the IRB was just approving it, and I think we're about to start Seattle VA. Uh, thus far, we've recruited 109 subjects at UHM CMC, only one of 45 at our center where we had an 18% failure rate has failed to swallow, which is a P of 0 0.005. That stylet that we put in really helps. Uh, at the other centers, there's been a few more failures to swallow. It's still less than it was with Generation 1. And I think there's a learning curve. A lot of it has happened with new study coordinators. We've gone from physicians passing it to study coordinators passing it. And just to show you how easy it has become, this is Wendy, our study coordinator, the first time, nothing rehearsed, nothing videotaped just got the videotape down because we wanted to send it to the study coordinators to show them and to get them over the nervousness of passing it. And I was talking to her during this video, telling her do this, do that, this is the next step, although she'd seen me do it uh, repeatedly. And also from DNA test, we are seeing more DNA um, than, than we are uh, with Generation 1 balloon. We would like to see this bottom actually shift up a little instead of just seeing more of people at the top. So this is the team, uh, mainly a case and, and a number of study collaborators and we're hoping to grow the collaboration with some of you in the room, especially for the detection study and, and get this device out and, and in your hands and learn from you how this 
device, where, where will this device fit in, who's going to use it as a gastroenterologist, primary care, keep trying to figure out is it in the office, is it an endoscopy suite, is it an inventory surgery center, trying to figure out how we use it to maximize our benefit to our patients. And it started with some funding from BetterNet, some spores, we got some funding from Ohio, and, and I have to acknowledge all, all the people who helped uh, get it to this point. Thanks.